God laid it on my heart a few years ago um, when we really started doing pretty much what we're doing uh, to give my wife a day out of the week. Friday, I call it Sweetie Pie Day, and it's her day. She gets to pick where we go, what we do, and it's usually what store we're going to. She likes to go around, look, and see what they have, and so I take her everywhere she wants to go, and we just spend that day. She gets to talk to me on Friday, and uh, if I got something to say, I get to talk to her as well, but the, the real... I guess one of the real reasons um, why I'm even here is my mother sitting back there and my wife busy downstairs. Um, they have made my life something worth living. So when you see one or both of them, give them a big hug, tell them thank you, or say, what were you thinking, or something like that. But, but I love to answer the questions. And... Um, <clears throat> We, some people were looking at Skinny Bob online, and the, the question was, you know, what, is that a real film of something that was not born here on this earth? Um, turn your Bible to Psalm 82. There's other places that we could go to, but for time's sake, um, I answered the question this way. I said, well, it looks like it's a film from the 40s, maybe 50s. And um, we know that they didn't have the special effects back then that they do now. We know that. Um, could it have been made with current special effects and made to look like it was something from the 40s, that's possible. If I didn't see what I see in the Bible, then I would be like a lot of other skeptical people. I would say, that's a bunch of hooey. I'm not going to waste time with that. There's more important things to deal with. Um, but I just grew up asking questions. And then I got to spend two weeks with one of my grandsons, Hunter, and he never shut up asking questions. <laughs> so I passed it down. But I did. I asked, I asked God every question that you can think of. Call unto me and I will answer thee. When God showed me that verse, I said, okay. And I just asked God, God, aliens real. What are those? Can that be possible? Are people just imagining this? Is that camera tricks? People just make believe this stuff. I don't think I don't think everybody does. In fact, the Air Force agrees. When they did Project Blue Book back in the 60s and 70s, the Air Force concluded falsely that there really is no it represents no threat. But the man that they tapped to run Project Blue Book, a, a physicist and astronomer by the name of J. Allen Hynek, he was as big a skeptical as anybody that there is alive on this planet now. And when he got done investigating, he said, I believe. Now, how does a guy go from saying that's all make believe, there's none of it real, to saying there's something there? Because... I can't remember what percent, about 10% of the cases, the thousands of cases of UFO sightings that he investigated, he concluded that there is no other explanation. It's not a weather situation. It's not a, it's not a weather balloon. It's not swamp gas. There were times when Hynek was clearly told to lie in his report. He was ordered by the Air Force to deliberately falsify the report to make, and that's where the whole swamp gas theory came up with. He's the one who came up with it. He had, to, he had a case in front of him that he knew had no other explanation. But the Air Force came down on him. He said, you, this, uh -uh, this never sees the light of day. This is something else. Make up something. So he said swamp gas. But he knew it wasn't swamp gas. And J. Allen Hynek spent the rest of his life 
telling everybody that would listen to him there's something flying in our skies that did not originate from this planet. He appeared in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Steven Spielberg based the movie upon him, and he has a little cameo there toward the end of it. He shows up in the film. Others who were skeptical at first, uh, who mentioned um, Stan Freeman? Who mentioned him earlier? You did. Okay, You got to talk to him? Uh, she said that she talked to a nun that came from Roswell and she said yeah all the nuns and so Stan Freeman went to find out these nuns you were talking about to to interview them because that's what he did he started out being a skeptic and he did his investigation and he said these people are not making this stuff up this real there's pictures photographic evidence video evidence there are is tangible evidence so then that that begs the question this is God's universe and that's what we believe right so is all of that make-believe or is the Bible wrong and there really are other people living on other planets and we're fixing to go to the days of Star Trek and fly around through the cosmos is that the reality is that what's gonna happen no this is God's universe and if it's real he made it Amen. and he has a plan so you could call this plan, Plan 9 from Outer Space. That's an actual movie. So, Psalm, I know my sci-fi. But anyway, Psalm 82. Imagine finding the answer to extraterrestrial life in a book of hymns. That's where it is. That's one of the evidences. Because I set up 1 o'clock in the morning, late last year, March of 2019, Asking God, God, I have to have an answer. I need an answer. One o'clock in the morning, the Holy Ghost quoted this verse to me. Verse 6, Jesus actually quoted this verse. I have said, ye are gods. That's what they are. And even to us, because of what they can do, they're gods. Do you think our forefathers just made believe all the myths and stories about the gods no they saw stuff and they modeled their gods after things that they saw some of those gods appeared to them is that even possible yeah. oh absolutely we know it is from scripture so we know they're gods are they good gods or bad gods bad gods bad gods you get a spanking get their nose rubbed in it right bad gods you're gods and all of you are children of the most high that answers the Genesis 6 question are the sons of God angels yes that answers that question children of the most high sons of God daughters of men but in verse 7 ye shall die like men gods don't die spirits don't die they're immortal these do yep. and they fall like one of the princes that's a principality that's what Paul told us we're wrestling against principalities princes so these princes fall out of the sky in their wheels and die like men so if you look at that skinny Bob video that's what everybody says hey I saw these things that's what they look like that's very similar to what I saw they all tell the same story so are some people lying yeah people lie all the time on the internet people lie all the time but not everybody's lying and if they're not lying, then what's the answer? The answer's got to be found in the scripture. If it's in God's universe, God put it in this book. Don't give me that nonsense. Not everything God does in the Bible. I'm telling you it's in the Bible. Amen? Amen? So, is it possible that technology came to us, to this planet, by way of these gods? Yes. Is that possible? Where did Noah get the idea to build the ark? It came from a supernatural source, in this case, God. God told him how long, 
how wide, how tall, what wood to make it out of, put three stories in it, uh, all of that stuff. What, and, and God showed him what to make, and Noah did it. How did Moses know how to build the tabernacle? God showed it to him. God gave him the instructions, but then, you know us, if we're going to put together a barbecue grill, I want pictures. Don't give me some Chinese guy that don't know English writing out the instructions for me. I want pictures. So God gave Moses the written instructions and then showed him the one in heaven. He said, see this? Build it like that. Moses received supernatural knowledge on how to build everything that was in the tabernacle. Okay? So, have devils inspired mankind? Has devils given man ideas? Where do you think Led Zeppelin wrote all the lyrics to their songs? Who inspired those songs? How do you think ACDC did it? How do you think Tom DeLonge wrote his songs? How do you think these people came up with these ideas? Man's not that smart. Bingo. So is it possible? Well, we found out from Scripture earlier that we know the kings from all of the Bible times were using magic, witchcraft, sorcery, wizardry. They were using occult forms to divine what was going to happen in the future. And the Bible tells us the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be, and there is no new thing under the sun. So here's what's interesting to me. A hundred years ago, these things that we have right here would be sorcery, witchcraft, magic. Oh, he's got a scrying tool. He's gazing into it. It's showing him images. No, it's just a TV. See, it's simple for us now. We, we grew up this technology. We know what it does. We know what it is. But a hundred years ago, that was sorcery. That was witchcraft. So whatever is sorcery and witchcraft, we're living in the age now to where we're learning how to adjust the sorcery with a screwdriver. We're learning how to build the magician's tools with blueprints and computer models. And we're building things that's going to aid people to be able to do things man couldn't do without it. We're already there. And it's coming. So if I said... Do you believe that the government possessed a machine that enabled people to peer into what they thought was the future? You think that's possible? So a guy steps forward and he says, I was in uh, special ops, then I got recruited into some of these black ops, and he said, I was working with some men at Area 51 on a project that they called Project Looking Glass. And he said they had a machine. They said they got it from aliens who left it here for us. They wanted it to benefit mankind. They're able to see time differently than we see it. And he said some people have been using this thing. And they said that one of the predictions that they made was that Hillary Clinton was going to be president after 26, 2012. Well, that didn't work out so well, did it? But hang on for a second. Wasn't she supposed to win? Isn't that what CNN, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox News, that's what everybody was saying. Isn't that what all the polls said? Isn't that what Harry Reid said? Isn't that what Nancy, Nancy Pelosi, they interviewed her and, they, and she said, Donald Trump will not be president. 100% guaranteed. 100% guaranteed. Donald Trump will not be president of the United States. <laughs> Didn't she say that? Yes. In almost that identical way. <laughs> With that witch eyes of hers, okay? What made them think that? What made them think that? She was guaranteed she was going to win. She was ready to walk into the White House. She posted, a, she tweeted a picture of herself from when she was a little girl, one of her school pictures, and said, I just found a picture of the future president of the United States in October 2016. She, if she, 
she could, she could have put a bet down of a million dollars that she was going to be president of the United States. And something changed. Something didn't happen that was supposed to happen. See, that's my point. Yes, there's no doubt that witches like Hillary probably use different methods of trying to discern the future. But they're not right all the time. And I think she put her trust in that. So what is looking glass? Well, we, I'll read the verses here in a little bit. Lewis Carroll. You ever heard of Lewis Carroll? Alice in Wonderland? Alice's adventures through the... His real name was Charles Dodgson. And he was trained, he went to school as a mathematician, but he became an Anglican priest, a Church of England vicar. And some say that they think now he was, had autism, like a form of autism, high functioning, and that he liked to write little parodies about scientific issues. And he wrote the whole Alice Adventures series on what he thought the fourth dimension was like. And he started out by having Alice go through a looking glass. Alice said, I wonder what it would be like to go into the room I see in the mirror. Well, she stepped in it. And that's exactly what the Bible says about we're seeing through a glass darkly. We're seeing as in a glass, our face. Okay? That's what the Bible says the sky is, as a molten looking glass. The barrier between us and heaven. And that realm is a mirror. It's what the Bible says, and that's what Lewis Carroll said, and that's what Alice did. She stepped into an alternate dimension, and she saw weird things in there, things that didn't make sense to us, correct? Okay, it was a parody on his understanding of the fourth dimension. So 1 Corinthians 13, where now we see through a glass, darkly. What glass? Is it just like a window? No, he's talking about a mirror. But then face to face, for now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I also am known. Job 37, hast thou with them spread out the sky, which is strong as a molten looking glass? 2 Corinthians 3, 18, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, he's talking about a mirror, are changed into the same image. We're going to go through the mirror. Which is what? Up there. Aren't we going up there? We're not going down there. Wrong mirror. We're going through that one. And we're going to be changed into that image. Amen. Amen. James 1.23. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. He's talking about a mirror. It's like looking at your face and then you walk off and you're going, did I comb my hair? Don't tell me you've never walked out of the house and forgot to comb your hair. John says it looks like that all the time, doesn't it? Okay. That's what he, listen, but look, look how he puts it. If any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer. See, if you believe it, you do it, right? Does Hillary believe the Bible? No. She forgot to look in this mirror. See it now? So is this a looking glass to see into the future? Oh, yeah, it is. But she don't do that. Neither does a lot of other people. So, this is the actual web page from the Central Intelligence Agency. And they're not going to tell you everything. But this page right here says, Summary of Known Remote Viewing Experiments. So let me explain that. They call it remote viewing because people get laughed at when you say, we're psychics for the CIA, dude. Okay? So they laugh at you. But the truth of it is, just like in the old Bible days, CIA wants... So let's say you don't know the launch sequence for a Russian intercontinental ballistic missile because we can't get a spy into the Russian missile silo. That's hard. We can't get somebody in there. So how can we see the launch sequence of a Russian nuclear missile 
any other way. Can we get the Russians to tell us? They're not going to tell us. So here's what they did. They hired psychics. They hired them, put them through training, put them through exercises. What we know, what they released publicly is that, yeah, they ran that program. I'm more curious about what they're not telling us. Okay? But they used psychics. Here's an article. CIA, CIA files reveal how U.S. used psychics to spy on Iran. Remember the Iranian hostage crisis, Jimmy Carter, 1978-1979? We didn't know where they were hiding the hostages. Carter, remember he sent that failed, stupid attempt at trying to be an American hero, and they shot our helicopter down, killed all our guys. We were trying to find out where they were holding the hostages. So the CIA recruited these psychics and said, see if you can look into the minds. And all they had to do was sit and focus and meditate, I guess, or whatever. And all of a sudden, these guys are getting images of possible locations where these hostages are being held. Actually happened. It, and Carter was supposed to be a Christian, wasn't he? And he didn't mind the CIA doing this. He wanted to be a hero before he wanted to get reelected. Okay? So it actually happened. Here's another one. Remote viewing. Resurrecting the CIA's art of psychic travel. The article says, along with a number of other experiments in extrasensory perception and psychokinesis, that means being able to move Mr. Alien here without touching it. Remote viewing was developed in the 70s as part of the U.S.'s Cold War era covert intelligence program, eventually known by the 1990s as the Stargate Project. Why the stars? Because that's the looking glass. A gate opens in the stars, so now we can see the future, or we can see across the world. Do you understand the meaning of Stargate now? Got it right from here. The gods are going to help us see these things. So applications included spying on military facilities behind enemy lines, the location of missing aircraft, personnel, fugitives, and hostages. It was defunded in 1995, don't believe that, and remote viewers involved in the government program today give workshops for civilian purposes such as industrial espionage. Wouldn't you like to start up a chicken restaurant knowing the 11 secret herbs and spices that Colonel Sanders used? There's only like three people in the whole world that know what the, that's in that chicken. So if you were a psychic you could be hired, believe it or not, you could make good money being hired by companies to look at other companies and what they're doing to compete against them. It happens. Um, let's see here. Industrial espionage. It has been alleged that active intelligence personnel secretly consulted military trained psychics for information following 9-11. You believe that? Okay? And by the way, do you believe everything the government tells you? Did they tell us there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? Yes. Were there? No. Nope. This article came out a couple years ago. A biopic, a new biopic, means a story, charts the life of a man by the name of Ingo Swan. They called the father of remote viewing. I've watched several things about him. I've read several things about Ingo Swan. One of the things I know was he was a homosexual, a sodomite. And he was pretty good. He was pretty good at it. Uh, let me see if I can show you some of the things. This is some of the things they did. Let me show you this. The target was this. The psychic drew this. Not bad. Here was the target. This before we knew who Bin Laden was. Here's what the psychic drew. Okay, here was the target, here's what the psychic drew. It's pretty close. They did this in cooperation with Stanford Research Institute. 
See that number? 333. Three, three. What's that verse? Okay. Let me go back here. This guy's name is Hal Putoff, Harold Putoff. He's an electrical engineer, remote viewing specialist for the CIA, founder of Operation Stargate. He worked with Ingo Swan. Um, now, why is he relevant? Why do I dig him up? Well, he's not dead. Ingo Swan is dead, but Hal Putoff's still alive. Hal Putoff works for Tom DeLong. To the Stars Academy. What is To the Stars Academy? Tom, you know who Tom DeLong is? Rock star, Blink 182. Nasty, nasty songs these guys sing. Okay? But notice the design on his guitar. Yeah, he is. And Tom DeLong took his rock and roll star money. And he formed a company called To The Stars Academy. And he hired Hal Putoff, who's the director of funded research programs. So why does, and he hired a lot of guys from the CIA and Department of Defense, Pentagon guys. All of these guys are specialists in areas relating to unidentified flying objects and their technology. Luis Elizondo was the front guy for the DOD's program, uh, ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, where the military sent Lou Elizondo out to investigate pilots who videotaped UFOs while on their mission or during training. They're the ones who released the three videos that you've seen on the news, you've seen on the internet. They call them the, the gimbal, the go fast, and the tic tac, because one of the UFOs looks like a giant tic tac. And they said it does things that nothing on earth can do. It defies the laws of physics. It could just stop in midair after going 3,000 miles an hour, just stop in midair and hover there. And it has, there's no wings, there's no propellers, there's no jet stream, there's nothing out of this. And then all of a sudden, boom, it's gone. And they had the video. So Lou Elizondo ran that program. He left and Tom DeLong hired him to help run To The Stars Academy. What is To The Stars Academy as a company doing? Well, number one, they produce books and music and movies. If you've watched the History Channel's Unidentified series, that's To The Stars Academy. Okay? Uh, they've written a couple books. But the other thing that they're doing is that they're developing technology based upon what they're only saying are tangibles. And what that means is that we have in our possession, or To The Stars Academy has in their possession, equipment that did not come from this planet. And we're developing technology like the ability to go from point A to point B at 6,000 miles an hour without accelerating or decelerating. The ability to make right angled turns without slowing down or making it a big curve. They even use the term developing warp drive technology. What does that mean? The ability to warp space and time so that you can, like the Enterprise, travel from here to Mars in about three minutes or beyond. People invest in this company. You think they're just buffoons wasting every government money? They're not using government money. They're using private money. And they're developing things that they say will propel us to a new world, a new age. So why then did Tom DeLong hire the CIA's top remote viewing specialist? Could it have something to do with the ability to look into the future using technology 
they say, instead of weird voodoo. But we all know where it comes from. What is that? IBM's quantum, that's why the letter Q is there, computer. And what does a quantum computer do that your phone can't do or your tablet or your desktop computer at home can't do? Your computer at home can play chess, it can play checkers, it can beat you pretty easily, beat me all the time, but it can beat you. And how does your computer at home do that? It takes your move and then starts running scenarios at thousands of calculations per second about what it should do based upon what it thinks you might do one move after another. And we now know that IBM's computer beat the best chess player in the world, Gary Kasparov. Beat him because it could look and do all these calculations and figure out all these moves faster than Gary Kasparov could. And it beat him. And he said, I give up. I quit. I'm not going to play it no more because I can't win. Remember what it said about the beast? Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And checkers and chess is, is a war game. It's a strategy scenario where your army is fighting their army and you're trying to win. And nobody can beat the beast at war. Nobody can. Why? Quantum computers don't just look at one move at a time and do it very fast. Quantum computers, as described by uh, one of the builders of quantum computers, what's his name, Steve? Huh? No, not Steve Jobs. Maybe I'm thinking of, maybe it's not a Steve. But the, one of the guys that's built one of these computers said, we're not using resources in this fabric of reality with quantum computers. We're actually tapping into another dimension and using those resources. What are resources in another dimension? Spirits. And how is it able to do that? Because it doesn't look at one move after another, Gary. The quantum computer can look at every possible move all at once. That's what a God can do. Does God, our God, see all of time all at once? Is there anything not known to our God? No. That's what they're trying to achieve. So with a quantum computer, could they realistically look forward into the future? Why not? Calculate every possible thing that could possibly happen and not have to, not have to wait a thousand years for the answer. <laughs> Had the answer right then because it's looking at every possible scenario all at once. That's magic. So Jeremiah 33, thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. I love you, Lord. Of course he knows everything. He made everything. Call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. That's my God. Now, Acts chapter 16, now we're New Testament. Came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination. So now the Bible's telling you this is an actual spirit. This is not... You know, everything that I've heard about the psychics, when I listen to the psychics talk and give their interviews, like Ingo Swan, Ingo Swan said what Hal Putoff said, what every other psychic says, you all have that ability. Sterling, you have the ability. Monica, you have it. We all have psychic ability. And if we just learn how to tap into that, then we could all make ourselves a better world. But it's not... All of us can do that. It's a spirit. A spirit of divination met us, which brought our masters much gain. See the money aspect of it? I mean, so think about your machine winning the lottery. Right? Do you think that it would be wise for some guys on Wall Street 
to have a machine that could predict stock prices. Would they use it? Oh, yeah. And would it make them a lot of money? Her master is much gained by Sue saying, The same followed Paul and us, cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Now, let me ask you a question about that phrase. Was there anything that she said that was wrong? No, it's not a trick question. There wasn't one thing about what she said that was wrong. So why then did Paul, and this did many days, but Paul being grieved turned around and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. Why did Paul get angry? Why did he get angry at her? Remember what Paul said about the truth that we follow? For we do not follow cunningly devised fables. Remember that? Now, I've said this a million times. Can you tell people a lie in order to tell the truth? Or should we try to find biblical truth in some other, from some other source? Should we do that? Should I read Lord of the Rings and say, I think Gandalf is Jesus? No. no. So look at what Paul's doing. Paul's telling us, uh, excuse me. We don't need the devil telling everybody how great our God is. And we won't use that. Come out of her. I'm tired of you. And Paul run that devil out of her. Because I'm like Paul. If I'm going to say it, I want to say it from God and no other source. Is that, is that right? Does that make sense? So, when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, <laughs> they caught Paul and Silas and drew them in the marketplace under the rulers. And see, this is, if I were Paul right now, I would be losing it. I'm fixing to get beat up. And brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. Okay? So the money aspect is real. Jeremiah 14. Verse 13, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophet say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. That sounds like Joel Osteen. Mm -hmm. You know, he's written more books than Paul. And he's made a lot more money at it than Paul. Yeah. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name, and I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and what? So where do these people get their prophecies from? God said they didn't get it from me. There's one way, there's one actual way that you can know whether or not God said something. If it ain't in there, he didn't say it. And a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. Jeremiah 27, 9. Therefore hearken not ye to your prophets, nor to your diviners, nor to your dreamers, nor to your enchanters, nor to your sorcerers, which speak unto you, saying, You shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you to remove you far from the land, that I should drive you out and ye should perish. In other words, in Jeremiah's day, the prophets were all saying, Don't worry, people. God's not going to kick you out and send you to Babylon. God said, Oh, yes, I am. And he said, Don't listen to those preachers. Don't listen to them. They're lying through their teeth. Jeremiah 29, 8, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Let not your prophets, you diviners, that be in the midst of you, deceive you, neither hearken to their dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and causing you to return to this place. You know what God's doing? He's saying, if you want hope, get it from me. And if you want to know the future, give it to me. God said, I'm going to put you in Babylon, but it's not going to be forever. It's going to be for 70 years. And in 70 years' time, do you think God forgot about them? Not a chance. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. And somebody say amen. amen. Uh, let's see here. I've got something else that's on my heart I want to share with you, but hang on. There was something else in here I was going to show you. I don't remember what it was. 
All right. Tell you what I'll do. Let me, let me do this. And if anybody has a question, now's the time to ask it while I'm wasting time. The verse I just read in Psalm 82, I've said, you're gods. Now, Jesus quoted that, okay? And what he was speaking of, he was speaking of the idea that we, because the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. So Jesus was contradicting their doctrine and saying, have you not read? I've said, you're gods, all of you children of the most high. So he's saying to the people, well, of course, there's a resurrection. Of course, you're going to live forever. You're going to be alive after you die. So now I don't know exactly what some people are saying. Um, hang on here. But there we go. I know that some people are teaching people that we are going to be gods. It's like I was showing you last night. Joel's, the whole Joel's army crowd, they believe they're going to be like supermen. They're going to take over the earth for Jesus and hand him the kingdom. So that, I believe, is where they're getting it from. Um, I know that Kenneth Copeland has taught people that same idea. And I think Joyce Meyer has, too. Um, and that, that we could, because we're twice born, that we can do the same things that God can do, that we can speak things into existence like God does, that we have God's power in our mouth like God has. That's heresy. That's a lie. Okay? But that's, they, these people believe that stuff. Uh, anybody else? All right. Um, let me get this started. We'll take one more break, and I'll, we'll bring you back. Turn to Deuteronomy. Actually, turn to um, 1 Peter. Turn to 1 Peter. And while you're turning to 1 Peter, I'll go through these verses. It's a completely different subject now. We were talking at lunch about, is there a seven-year tribulation? I used to believe that the first thing that happens is the rapture. And God's not going to put any bad thing on this earth until we're safely captured up into heaven. And I went, whew, because I don't like paper cuts. I don't like seeing blood. I just don't like it. So that's what I believed. I believed it because it was convenient. But then I made a deal with God in 1997. God, if you're going to study, if you're going to show me prophecy, then you have to put it in me that I don't know anything. I want to pretend like I've never learned anything and I'm going to start from scratch and start all over again. And if there is going to be a seven-year tribulation, then I'm going to read it in no uncertain terms. I'm going to read it word for word, and it's going to say that. And then I'm going to say, this is what the Bible says. So I just started looking for things, looking for things like the rapture. Now that I believe, that we're going to be caught up in the air. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. We're going to be caught up with them. We're going to be the body of Christ. We're going to appear with him in the air. We're going to be with Jesus one of these days. Trumpets are going to sound. Shouting's going to take place. Dead people are going to rise up out of graves. I believe that 100%. The issue is when. And people say, well, you're a post-trib then. You're a mid-trib. No, don't call me anything like that. Because I don't think that term even comes close to describing what God says is going to happen in his word. Here's what I believe, and I believe it as certain as I'm standing here in front of you today. I believe it. I believe a fiery trial is coming. A season, a time. It's not seven years. I don't even think it's three and a half years. I don't think it's a year. But it's coming, sure as I'm standing here. God says it multiple places in his word. 
And if I were to follow the way I was 20 some odd years ago, then I would have to take all the verses that I have and I would have to dismiss them as if they didn't exist or that they didn't apply and say, I, well, I can't use those in my... It's like a pharmaceutical company. They find out that their test medicine is killing 80% of the people. So they wipe out 80% of the data and say, this is he helping all these people. They've done that before, haven't they? Okay, that's what that's like. If you've got Bible verses telling you something's going to happen, I think you ought to believe it. Amen. So God says, Take heed unto yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image, or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God... Hath... What, when he says graven image here, which one is he talking about? The one that everybody's going to make in the last days. Right? Because it all points to prophecy. Don't be part of making that. He said, for the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. And I believe it. Deuteronomy 9, Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. Boy, I believe that one. A people great and tall. Do you believe that? Children of the Anakims, whom thou knowest and of whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak. That sounds like who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him. Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee as a consuming fire. He shall destroy them. Is God going to destroy us? No. Who's he after? Them. And he shall bring them down before thy face, so shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said unto thee. So now, 1 Peter. I read 1 Peter all the way through, and God said, turn around and read it again. And I started seeing things. What really stood out to me, and I'll go ahead and read this verse to you, 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. And I went, that's what I think about the rapture. I think nothing's going to happen to me. And now I find out that I'm going to have to go through a fiery trial. That's strange. And God said, don't think that way, Mike. Don't think it strange as if some strange thing has happened and you were, this wasn't supposed to be this way. Because I think... A lot of people are going to get thrown completely off when the rapture doesn't happen, when they think it's supposed to happen. And they're going to say, oh, the Bible's probably not right. That's what I think could happen. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy, aren't you glad for that? Amen. Hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you how many of you had reservations when you came to town here good you ever had a reservation canceled did that tick you off it was a reservation I know but we gave your car away or we filled your room excuse me it was my room that's what a reservation is. Sir, we know what a reservation is. I don't think you do. If you knew what it was, I would have my room. Jesus is not going to give it away for you. Amen. Amen. Who are kept by the power of God through faith, not works, unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That last time's coming, right? Wherein ye would greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through many fold temptations. Gary, what did Gary say a while ago when he sang his song? He said, I was really struggling. And God reminded me, Gary, turn to Jesus. Gary, turn to Jesus. Now, Gary doesn't have the keyboards and all the sounds and the background vocals that I have. But the song came from heaven. Amen? Amen? That's what makes it beautiful, Gary. 
And you thought you were writing it to be a blessing to somebody else. And it was. But that was for you. Because we get in heaviness through manifold temptations, don't we? That the trial of your faith, your faith, do you really believe this book? Trish, you really believe this book? Of course you do. She's, Trish has helped us here believe God. Believe God. God can do anything. God can raise her dad back to life. And he did. Seven times. Seven times. Uh-oh. He's only got two more if he's a cat, all right? So. <laughs> Trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. See, my wife and I, we've been through that fire. Finding out she had breast cancer. The story cannot be told of how hard that was on both of us. But God got us through. And that's why she's more precious to me now than she ever was. And isn't that how it is? You know, my grandma didn't throw food away. Mima didn't throw food away. If she cooked it the night before and it was left over, that was lunch next day. And it didn't matter if there was four kernels of corn in that bowl. There's four kernels of corn next day in the lunch table. Why? Because she came from a time they didn't have no food. And they didn't throw buffets away. Right? Because they went through the fire and things were precious. And they learned how to hold on to them. And see, that's all God's doing in your life, Gary. It's all he's doing. He's teaching you, don't throw this away. And I'm going to make it to where you'll beg God for it, God says. You'll beg him. Give me your word, God. And God will say, see, this is more important than anything else in the world. Amen. So why can't God do that? That might be found praise and honor and glory. When? When is he going to do this? He says it at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So do you believe that? Amen. Whom having not seen you love. Isn't that strange? You love a guy that you have never even seen before. We believe in a God that everybody else says doesn't exist. We believe in him so much that we'd rather be shot and killed than to deny him. We would be burned at the stake rather than deny him. If that's what it takes. Whom have you not seen you love, and whom though you now see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full. I'll have that song in my head all day. Receive, watch this, receiving the end of your faith. Right now, we have faith, right? We don't have substance. We have faith. But the faith then comes to an end when we have sight. Even the salvation of your souls. God's not done yet. He saved you. Is saving you. Will save you. Amen. Amen. So what does he mean? Turn to look at verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. I'm going to give you a break in a minute. Who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. When it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. 
unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from Evan Peter. You write long sentences. <gasps> which things the angels desire to look in. Angels don't even know this. Isn't that something? God has made you lower than the angels and yet he's crowned us with glory and he's shown us things that he won't even tell the angels. That's why you don't ask them to show you the future. They'll go, I think that's going to happen that way. Okay? And you just don't believe that. So he says, verse uh, 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober, not drunk. Don't drink beer. Don't drink wine. Don't drink alcohol. Stay away from that stuff. And don't read Joyce Meyer books. Amen. And don't let Benny Hinn touch you on the forehead. Amen. And don't go to that Baptist preacher in North Georgia and go through his fire pit baptistry that I talked about last night. Don't do that. God will turn you over. You're supposed to be sober in your mind. Hope to the end for the grace that is be brought unto you when? At the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the second witness now in the same chapter he said it. When is it going to happen? When Jesus was revealed. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance? How ignorant were you back in the day? Don't, don't tell. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That means not just on church day. Every day.